I don't care if you use rainwater, well water, city water, ocean water. If you don't have any fresh water, go ahead and use snow. If you don't have any snow available to you, then use salt water because there's no adverse effect to the fuel cell. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to Brain Scratch for January 26th, 2018. That clip we just watched was Stanley Myers, an inventor who proclaims that he made a engine that can run solely on water back in the mid-90s. A few short years later, he would wind up dead. And of course, conspiracy theories continue to this day discussing this case. So today we're going to take a look at it right here on Brain Scratch. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Starting with the newspaper clipping here, did Stanley Meyer die because he knew how to turn water into fuel? This was posted in July of 1998. And down here, we also see a photo of Stan in his vehicle. It was originally a VW buggy that he has converted to run on water. Now, uh, the main principle behind that is that the water is separated from the, the hydrogen and the oxy oxygen molecules are separated. So essentially, it's really an engine that is running on hydrogen. And this is not unheard of. If we jump over to Forbes here, this is an article from way back in 2005. I, I looked this up specifically because I remembered this. Uh, our governor at the time, Arnold Schwarzenegger, had a uh, H2 Hummer that was running on hydrogen. Now, pretty interesting read if you check out on Forbes here. There was a lot of conditions that weren't really publicized about this vehicle. At least I didn't know about it at the time. For example, uh, he couldn't drive it unless he had one of the engineers with him at the same time. Uh, also, in terms of how they refuel it, you know, fi finding hydrogen um, sources to refuel it isn't the easiest thing outside of California. So, a couple of interesting as aspects to it, but. Yes, vehicles can run on hydrogen. There's also an episode of Mythbusters where they tested this. They literally just took a regular engine. They brought a can of hydrogen up to it. They blew the hydrogen into the carb and started the engine and it ran no problem. So conventional gasoline engines can run uh, with very, very few tweaks to them on hydrogen. Moving on to a website called stanmeyersparkplug.com. Um, we see another shot of the water-powered buggy down here. Uh, this is a website by someone that is looking to follow in Stan's footsteps that kind of wants to pick up his work and continue with it. He's trying to raise funds to do so. How's he doing? Well, we'll find out by the end of the episode, but I wanted to use this as kind of a launching point for the story. So Stan Meyer, the Ohio inventor that created a water splitting device that broke the conventional laws of thermodynamics. Now, that is part of the main problem here. The quick way to explain the argument about could you really do this or not is, yes, we know that you can basically electrify water and you can get these molecules to split. People have been doing that since the 1800s, late 1800s, according to some of the research I've done. There's, there's no question that you can do that. Where it becomes an issue is how much hydrogen can you produce at what rate and how much energy does it cost to do that? Because you need something to power the electricity that's allowing that to happen. Uh, essentially, you can't get more out of a system like this than the energy it takes being put into it. Uh, so that's that's where this gets a little bit sticky in terms of belief structure. Uh, basically, most legit scientists, uh, doctors, whatever you want to call them, will say these are laws of nature. You cannot break these laws. There is no way that he was able to extract enough hydrogen to keep an engine powered. He was able to splint water, I think he means split, water into its basic components, hydrogen and oxygen, using the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid. Um, at first, I thought this guy that was writing this webpage just dropped that in, but I actually have watched a bunch of videos of Stan talking about it himself, and that's a direct quote from Stan, and he was really talking about uh, his patents, about how he was designing his patents and getting those registered with the patent office because if things are too complex, the more complex things are, the easier it is for someone to come in, look at your patent, change one or two things in the details and say, oh, this is my own invention and run off with it. So um, it's, it's a little bit of a misstatement here that he was using the KISS method in terms of his development. He was really using it in terms of his patent submissions. Uh, Stan was able to get a dune buggy to run simply on water. 
This is a very controversial statement. Uh, in that new segment that we started this episode with, you see the buggy, it's driving around. There's a bit of a question of, is it really running on water or not? And I've watched a lot of videos about this car in particular. From what I can see, the gasoline engine is left pretty much completely intact on the back of this vehicle. I think he removed the rear seats and that's where he's added the equipment for the hydrogen uh, engine part. Um, but I don't know. We'll see if we can get some experts advice here. Uh, I don't know if the footage that we're seeing in those news clips of this vehicle driving down the road, if it's running in particular on gasoline or if it's running on hydrogen. Uh, another point where this gets sticky, I've watched some really long and in-depth videos where Stanley is uh, working with the technology and explaining all the different features and functionality of it. He literally has switches on these devices to cut between supposedly the hydrogen or the gasoline feed, and he can do it per cylinder. So it's, it's kind of weird because in one way, I see him experimenting with this thing almost like he is creating a possible hybrid engine. And this is back, you know, in the mid 90s. But it doesn't seem like he's thinking about it along those lines or marketing it in that way at all. Every time I see him speaking about it, he's saying this thing is running only on water. The whole idea of hybrids, I don't know if they were really... I don't think it was that popular back in the mid 90s to think of a hybrid engine, you know, an engine where you have the energy um, being supplemented by something else. But interesting stuff either way. If the device worked as specified, it would violate both the first and second laws of thermodynamics, according to Wikipedia. Sadly, and here I really wanted to use this article because of this sentence. Sadly, he passed away after drinking poison cranberry juice during a business meeting at a local restaurant in Ohio back in 1998. It is just such a weird oversimplification of the events around his death. Uh, the question is, can we find much better detail than that? Because that is kind of the main belief here. So I'm hoping that's what we're going to be able to do as we move through today's episode. Jumping over to topalternativeenergysources.com, uh, they have a write-up specifically on Stanley where we get to learn a bit more about the man and his backstory. Uh, Stanley Meyer was born August 24th, 1940, and was one of two twin boys. His twin brother is Stephen Meyer, and he actually works with Stanley on a lot of this technology. If you watch the videos, you'll frequently see the brothers working together on this stuff. Meyer was born and lived on Columbus's east side before moving to Grandview Heights, where he finished high school. He briefly attended Ohio State University and joined the military. At six foot three and with a booming voice, Stanley Meyer was charismatic and persuasive. Uh, he once called Grove City Police to his home and laboratory on Broadway to report a suspicious package. The Columbus bomb squad detonated the parcel only to discover it was equipment that he had ordered. Um, sounds a bit eccentric too. They didn't quite name that in, in when they were listing off his attributes. But uh, for employment, Meyer worked for the Battelle Foundation in Ohio. Uh, I wasn't sure what that was, so I actually looked it up. They're still around. Um, from their about page, Battelle's vision is to be a major force in science and technology uh, discovery and in the translation of knowledge into innovative applications that have significant societal and economic impacts. One of the things that they've developed, which I found just kind of interesting in a side note, is this drone defender device. I know it kind of looks like a rifle, but apparently you aim this at a drone and you're able to disrupt the control of that drone. Do they sell a neighborhood version of that yet? Because I think I'd have a little fun with that. <laughs> um, moving back to uh, learn more about him here. Uh, he also worked on the Gemini project with NASA and he worked on a feeding system for energy for the Star Wars project. So certainly a pretty experienced background. One of the criticisms that you'll read about him if you're reading into, into this stuff is, well, he doesn't have a degree, you know, he didn't finish college, how's he doing all this stuff? Uh, personally, 
I don't hold a lot of stock in that thought because I think there's a lot of inventors out there that don't have a formalized degree. Uh, I believe if I recall correctly, Bill Gates is also a college dropout. So I don't necessarily write off the possibility that he could have developed something like this just because he didn't complete college. For achievements, Myers was elected inventor of the year in Who's Who of America in 1993. Uh, now we get to an interesting tidbit here about the actual water fuel cell technology. Uh, Meyer made a demonstration before Professor Michael Lofton, Dean of Engineering at Mary College London. Okay, keep that name in mind. They all agreed that Meyer's cell developed at the inventor's home in Grove City, Ohio, produced far more hydrogen and oxygen mixture than could have been expected by simple electrolysis. Meyer had euphoric highs and humiliating defeats. He was kind and generous, yet paranoid and suspicious. He also would be sued and declared a fraud. Uh, let's jump over to Wikipedia to get a little more information about the lawsuit here. In 1996, Meyer was sued by two investors to whom he had sold dealerships offering the right to do business in water fuel cell technology. His car was due to be examined by the expert witness... Michael Lofton, uh, professor of electrical engineering at Queen Mary University of London. Now, according to the last article we read, that's the same guy that confirmed that this engine was doing something they didn't expect, producing more hydrogen and oxygen uh, as opposed to conventional uh, electrolysis. It's strange because Wikipedia gives us a little bit of a different outcome of Professor Lofton's analysis compared to the last website we were on. Uh, here it states that Meyer made what Professor Lawton considered a lame excuse on the days of examination and did not allow the test to proceed. So this guy was supposed to be the expert witness, uh, went to go do his job, and these lame excuses kept coming up, so he didn't get to actually test uh, the car. His, quote, water fuel cell was later examined by three expert witnesses in court who found there was nothing revolutionary about the cell at all and that it was simply using conventional electrolysis. The court found Meyer had committed gross and egregious fraud and ordered him to repay the two investors their $25,000. So uh, like I mentioned, we've seen footage of the car driving. I don't know if it's running on gas or not. It doesn't seem to be kicking out a lot of smoke, but I really can't base my analysis solely on that. Uh, I did want run into some other websites where people were talking about uh, that they had met him. They asked if the car was there. The car would never seem to be there. They asked if they could uh, potentially see it drive You know, conveniently. That was never allowed to happen. I've even heard from a family member of his uh, that wanted to check out this car that she was allowed to sit in it, but not... Uh, go for a ride in it. And there's some other information about this later. So I'm, I'm really not sure how functional uh, this car was. And I'm kind of thinking that perhaps at best he did have a hybrid going on here where maybe he was getting some hydrogen out of water and he was pumping that in where he could, but the engine was also running with gasoline. That's, that's kind of what I think, at least when the cameras were around. Wikipedia does also have a version of his death. Let's go ahead and cover that. Stanley Meyer died suddenly on March 20th, 1998, after dining at a restaurant. His brother claimed that during a meeting with two Belgian investors in a restaurant, Meyer suddenly ran outside saying, they poisoned me. After an investigation, the Grove City Police went with the Franklin County Coroner report that ruled that Meyer who had high blood pressure, died of a cerebral aneurysm. Some of Meyer's supporters believe that he was assassinated to suppress his inventions. Um, once again, it's a little bit more detail on this one, but still kind of a brief version of this story. From what I understand, uh, he did indeed meet up with two Belgian investors. One of these guys may have been working with NATO. I don't know why that's important, but that does come up. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, they were toasting, they were celebrating that I think they were celebrating a deal uh, where these guys were going to help him develop further. I think that they were looking at some property that they were going to lease for him to possibly create a lab on, something along those lines. But they were celebrating their deal. He had a sip of cranberry juice, if I recall correctly, um, 
left the table, didn't really say why he was leaving the table, just excused himself and went outside. His brother was wondering what was happening, got up, went outside and found him um, vomiting really hard and possibly through the act of vomiting uh, in that way, the cerebral aneurysm might have occurred. It's a really tough thing. I've looked into poisons particularly to cause cerebral aneurysms, and I can't find information about poisons that would do that specifically because you have to target a certain part of the body to really make that happen, namely the blood vessels uh, around your brain. So um, it's one thing to you know attack the... Um, cardiopulmonary system, uh, you know, you might be able to get someone sick, certainly through poisoning them to the point where they're throwing up, but to then have an aneurysm and, and know that that's an actual outcome of the poison that you've given them. I really don't know. The other thing I question is his statement about they poisoned me. Uh, if he was having an aneurysm, was he feeling uh, was he basically in his right mind? Could he? Could his perceptions have been altered by what was going on uh, with him at that time? So I, I kind of question that. But that's kind of the longer version of the story as I understand it. Let's uh, go ahead and continue here. Over to dailybrainfreeze.com. I like the name of that website. It's close to Brain Scratch. Um, here they state that he died suddenly on March 27th, 1998. The date doesn't seem right. Uh, I have seen another website where they show, they call it the autopsy report, but it's really the coroner's report and the toxicology report specifically. And the dates seem to coincide with what we see on Wikipedia. It was actually March 20th. Um, the date on the coroner's report, if I recall correctly, says that his body was viewed on the 22nd. So that would make sense. But if he did indeed die on the 27th, that would make no sense whatsoever. So I just wanted to call that out. But let's see if we can get some more detail here. Um, Stephen Meyer recalls the events of that evening. Quote, Stanley took a sip of cranberry juice. Then he grabbed his neck, bolted out the door, dropped to his knees and vomited violently. I ran outside and asked him what's wrong. Uh, he shouted, they poisoned me. That was his dying declaration. So even there, we're getting a little bit of a different story. Uh, there is an interview with two family members of his, I believe his sister and his niece. They made an interesting statement during that interview that Stephen really didn't say anything about the um, coroner's uh, report, that the information that the coroner kicked out about it being an aneurysm, that Stephen never really said that that wasn't the case or that he thought that that was an incorrect outcome. Uh, however, it does seem like Stephen is, by all accounts, laying low, like he has stopped working on this project altogether, even though he was a pretty big part of it, working with his brother in the development of this. Uh, is it possible that he's just been scared into silence? I think we should consider that, but he definitely hasn't spoke up on it. It looks like he's denied interview requests. So Meyer's death, March 21st, 1998. Well, here they've corrected their own uh, information because up here they said maybe it's just a typo on the 27th, uh, sparked a three-month investigation that consumed and fascinated Grove City Police. But in the end, the coroner's report listed the cause of death as a brain aneurysm. Uh, Meyer's death was laced with all sorts of stories of conspiracy, cloak and dagger stories, said Grove City Police Lieutenant Steve Robinette, lead detective on the case. If Stephen Meyer was shocked at his twin brother's collapse and death, he was equally amazed at the Belgians' response the next day. I told them that Stan had died and they never said a word, he recalled. Absolutely nothing. No condolences. No questions. I never, ever had a trust of those two men ever again. Now, who are those two men? Well, here's a picture of them right here. Uh, this information has also been confirmed by the niece and sister in the interview that I was mentioning earlier, which you can find in the description box below, as well as the sources for everything I'm looking at here. Uh, and here we have even the names of the two gentlemen. Now, what I am wondering is maybe they did want to do a deal with him. Uh, I'm going to let my brain just go into conspiracy territory here a little bit. Uh, we know that he was filing patents on this. Patents really have a very detailed explain, explanation of how these things work or how they're supposed to work. Uh, the one thing that's tricky about patents is they don't have to be written about actual technology. You can kind of write about things that aren't really quite in existence yet. So his patents in particular have a lot of 
um, detailed information in them about how the, this whole fuel cell is supposed to work. As a matter of fact, let me just bring it up for you real quick. You can see we've got uh, his full patent, which describes exactly what this item is, how it's supposed to work. But you've also got images, I mean, literally schematic breakdowns. Um, we've got tons of other images that have left been left behind by him. We have video all over the place where he's showing how these things are working. I'm wondering if we are going to go down the conspiracy angle here, uh, could it be that they felt like they didn't need him? Could it be that they wanted to have this business and not have to pay him his cut of it? And they felt like they had enough information out there where if he was really doing what he said he could do, they could just re-engineer it. Uh, especially if he did have this buggy that was already a working model. Could it be that if they got their hands on that buggy, that they could reverse engineer it and just not need Stan to be part of this picture at all? That could help explain the type of response that his brother is saying he got from them. Uh, but so could cultural differences. These guys might have just like, you know, they, they might just respond to things differently than, than he's expecting. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It really sends my brain in a few directions, but that is kind of the main story about how Stan died. Uh, I did find this video on YouTube that is showing what they're calling the autopsy report, which I mentioned earlier. It's not really the autopsy report. It's the coroner's report and the toxicology. That is all that's here. A full autopsy report has many more pages, has a lot more detail. When I first saw this video, I was questioning its authenticity. I've been able to confirm most of the information on it seems accurate. They've got the right address. They do have his wife's name. Um, it's weird just because whoever typed this up really didn't know how to use a typewriter very well. And when I first saw this video, I was just like, this has to be fake. No one, no one types this badly. And then also considering this happened in 1998, would a form like this really be typed anyway? I now believe that it is. I believe that this is legit information in this autopsy report. So you'll find a link to that in the description box below as well. It doesn't really tell us anything different. Um, they have a blurb written up basically about him meeting with those guys. The same story that we've been telling, um, that they had an opening toast. He had cranberry juice. He ran outside. All of that is also included here. Um, but their clear determination is that he suffered an aneurysm. Moving forward to Yahoo Answers, um, just a little clarification. Aneurysms are simply weakenings of blood vessel walls, causing them to stretch. Aneurysms are caused by one of two things, high blood pressure or weakened blood vessels. I'm not aware of any poisons that cause aneurysms, says a fourth year medical student. I could not find anything in terms of poisons that would cause aneurysms. Um, but it was, it was interesting in the... Um, I wish I could remember the show's name, but I can't off the top of my head. In the radio interview with his sister and niece, uh, the host kind of talks about that as well. And it's almost like considering, was he poisoned by something that that was making him throw up? And then because of how hard he was throwing up, could that have made the aneurysm situation come about? Apparently, that is a possibility. But like I said, I mean, if you're planning on killing someone, that's a bit of a loose possibility. Um, at least expecting the aneurysm to be the thing that, that took him out. Maybe the poison would have kept working on him. Maybe, um, you know, he would have kept getting sick and he would have died some other way from the poisoning. But we also have the toxicology results that don't show that they found anything. Of course, it's always a big question when it comes to those tests, because it's not like they test for every single poison known to man. They kind of test these buckets of, um, of commonly known and used items. So... Jumping over to aardvark.co.nz, um, there's a whole article here on debunking Stanley Meyer's claims. And interestingly, at the start of the article, they say they're also going to look into how he died and was he really the victim of a huge conspiracy. But for some reason, the article never does that. So I don't know if it was on here and then the author removed it for some reason. I, I really don't know. Um, but in terms of debunking it, Popular arguments you're going to see here. Uh, Meyer had no qualifications as a scientist. It also questions how much hydrogen hydrogen could be produced, particularly talking about the voltage and the wattage that he was dealing with specifically. And they're saying that it would produce less than a liter per minute. And if we take another look uh, for an engine that would be running 
a six and a half horsepower engine at 1500 RPMs. It would need 240 liters per hour or four liters per minute. So if you're only producing one liter per minute and you need four, and that's only for a six and a half horsepower engine, the likelihood that you're going to be able to run a car on that is practically none. It's just, it would not be possible. Now, people that support the argument here, um, I don't know if this is just kind of new stories that have been made to to kind of debunk the debunkers, but people that support his argument say, no, he was using lower voltages. That's part of the trick. He was doing this thing where he was kind of oscillating the wave frequency. He was essentially, um, you know, popping it up and down. And that is, uh, it, it's extracting the hydrogen in a bit of a different way at a, at a much lower voltage. So, you know, where we have people like this um, author analyzing it using conventional understandings of electrolysis at that type of wattage or voltage, that really doesn't apply in particular to Stanley's model because his was doing something that these conventional models don't do. Of course, however, we have the experts from the lawsuits saying, no, that's not the case, that this was just standard electrolysis that was going on. So big question. Um, a patent for a device is some kind of proof that it works. Oh, he's stating that there's this misconception that just because you get a patent on something doesn't mean that it actually works. I can tell him that is certainly true. You don't have to have it working when you see people talking about this case and they're like, well, it's patented. You know, that that must mean that he knew what he was doing. And not necessarily. You, there's a lot of weird patents out there. Trust me, <laughs> you can you could probably just do a show on on weird patents. And a big one. This is a really big one, especially for someone that even if you're not a graduate or you're not a formal doctor of some kind of science, there were no independent scientists or others who were prepared to state categorically that Stan Meyer's technology actually worked as claimed. If I had made this awesome invention like this, um, first of all, Stan spoke about how he believed that you could drive from one side of the country to the other on 22 gallons of water only. If I had this invention, the first thing I would do is exactly that. I wouldn't just get the news channels together and say, well, I think you could get from California to New York on 22 gallons of water. I would do it. Think of the press that you would drum up as you're driving town through town through to take all the time in the world, make, make a month out of it. Uh, it would be insane in terms of the press that you could drum up by actually pulling that off. However, you would also need... Um, you know, scientific backing, you would, I would need to find an expert to go along with me to ensure that I'm not flipping that switch and kicking on the gas engine here or there. As a matter of fact, I would probably remove the gas engine or uh, incapacitate it in some obvious way where the expert would be able to check on that regularly and say, yeah, we're, we're sure that we're not running on gas here. You know, maybe emptying the gas tank <laughs> or something. I don't, I don't know. Um, but Stan doesn't quite do that. And even after watching his material, I struggle because he goes from these explanations that are super over oversimplified, like when he's on these news segments, you know, yep, you could just use water, you could use snow, it could be salt water, it could be tap water, whatever. But if you watch the more detailed stuff, he gets super, super technical, but not in a way where it seems like he's really trying to explain things well to other people, just in a way where he's trying to explain what he's doing at that particular time with that particular item in his hand, not how it relates to the whole thing. I just, I found his communication method questionable. Uh, if you are really trying to convey this type of information to people that might not necessarily understand it, I don't feel like he was doing the best job. It could just be that that's part of his personality. Maybe he's not a very social person. I don't know. But after a lot of material that I've reviewed of his, I'm really not convinced. Um, I'm, I'm not super convinced that he was being completely as transparent about what these things were doing and how they were interacting as he could be. For example, in one of the videos, he spends so much time on the injection system where he's basically talking about, um, I mean, it looks to me like he's just made a new electronic injection system for his car. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the hydrogen separation at that point, at least the way he's not explaining it, it doesn't. Um, so it just, it really left me with a lot of questions after I was watching his material and just saying, you know, I don't, I don't know if he's really covering the things that I would be covering if I had this type of invention going, 
you know, um, and maybe he wasn't because he was trying to keep the secret sauce, so to speak. Maybe he didn't want to let others figure out how it was working because he wanted to make a bunch of money on it or something along those lines. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is even a theory by uh, Dr. Stephen Greer. I'll have a video from him talking about this case down below as well, where uh, he's saying that Stan Meyer actually wrote his patents incorrectly on purpose because he did not want people coming in after the fact being able to recreate it. Well, that's kind of convenient, but it leaves all of us with a huge question now because you've got this guy that said he had something working. We've got this buggy somewhere. Do we know where the buggy is? We'll, we'll touch on that by the end of the episode. Um, we've got all this information he's left behind that supposedly, especially now that the patents have lapsed, other people should be able to take that information, run with it, create what he said he was able to create and produce these things, at least have, have some of them driving down the road or something like that. And we're not quite seeing that. There is an, a whole industry uh, that is out there saying, you can buy this little conversion kit for your car and you will be able to supplement your car's engine with hydrogen using this conversion kit. So once again, the things that I am seeing out there, if, if he is responsible for those developments, it's once again, a hybrid situation, not quite a full-blown water running your engine situation. Although, trust me, there are websites out there that say you can do that too. You just have to buy their pamphlet for a hundred bucks or something. So um, I, I don't know. Of course, the naysayers also bring up that he was convicted of fraud in 1996. That wasn't the only case. And I didn't know this until I heard his family being interviewed. Uh, he had other cases that he also lost. He was forced to return money to other people as well. So there's more than one case where that happened. What Meyer has done is what many scam artists do with bad science. They come up with an idea that has a basis in good science, like electrolysis in this case, and then claim to have developed some major breakthrough that extends it into the realm of miracle. And to try to make them themselves credible, they steal little snippets of science from other areas, such as resonance, and patch it in to what seems, in the eyes of a grade school understanding of science, a credible explanation. So essentially when I was talking about the um, electricity oscillating, that's the theory, the resonance theory that's been worked in here. Uh, according to this paper, the, the frequencies that he was talking about that should be affecting the water wouldn't affect it in the slightest. So um, I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about that stuff to really speak to it. I'm just telling you what I'm reading in terms of what this guy has wrote on this. Um, ponder this, despite the patent process requiring full disclosure of how a device works, nobody has been able to reproduce Meyer's claims to the extent that they're verifiable by independent scientific testing. It's a very, very good point. Jumping back to the article at topalternativeenergysources.com, Stanley Meyer took to his death key elements of his work. As such, his work on the water fuel cell was not completed. Stephen Meyer is the only person who knows the intricate secrets of the water fuel cell invented by Stanley. After watching the trials and tribulations Stanley had been through, Stephen refuses to continue his brother's work. So um, kind of again, once again, points back to that theory that maybe he was not being completely truthful in his patents, and that's why people are not able to recreate it. So... Even if that's the case, we have the working model, right? Where's the buggy? Well, according to waterpoweredcar.com in a September 2014 update, Stan's dune buggy is in Canada. It was bought off the Hallbrook family for a down payment and royalty of the duplicating was to follow, but was taken to Canada so the corporation would not have to pay any more money. So the way this is written... The family that had it, the Holbrook family, got ripped off. They were given the down payment only. They would say, they said, we were going to re-engineer this. We're going to make more, and then we'll give you uh, a royalty on those things. But instead, they took the car to Canada and stopped paying them all together. Stephen Meyer is alive and knew as much as Stan did. An eyewitness to the dune buggy sale said that the VW engine ran beautifully. They did not run it for many buyers. They told most buyers it did not run. Now, I'm really curious about that. Why? 
if you were trying to sell this thing, why are you going to tell certain people, yeah, it doesn't run, but then a couple people come by and you're like, okay, well, let's go ahead and crank it up. Yeah, check it out. Runs runs good, doesn't it? And this article is not addressing what is clear in the videos. He literally had switches per cylinder for switching between gas or hydrogen. So could it have run beautifully? Yes. We still don't have the question answered. Was it running on hydrogen? I don't know. And what about the website that we started this whole thing with the guy that was looking to follow in the footsteps and to reproduce this? Well, he made a nice video about it, put it on GoFundMe, only raised $770. I think he was trying for somewhere around 25,000 or something like that. He's also got a Kickstarter, but it's not active. It's kind of in a draft state where you can see that he's trying again. Uh, I don't know if he's actually gonna turn that on or not. Um, I don't know. To me, it'd be a huge invention, obviously. I think it's really important. I think just looking into the conspiracy theories and the audience around the story of Stan and his invention and his death, I would figure there'd be a good enough audience to raise some cash on this, but 770 bucks, not quite a whole lot. And there are people still playing with it, no doubt. In their garages, they're still working with it. I found a video of one person in particular I want to share with you guys as we're closing this episode out. Oh, I could feel you that. You see how fast that was going? Okay, do that again. Let's see Watch what the this here. Is. Holy s***. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure blew your bubble thing apart. Yeah. Yes, the pressure blew your bubble thing apart. <laughs> oh, man. Uh... I just, I love that clip. Um, there are there are still developments happening in this area. Don't get me wrong. There is literally a car you can buy that does run on hydrogen. It is called the Toyota Mirai. I guess Mirai actually means future. Fully runs on hydrogen. Literally water comes out of the back of it. Um, but it does not run on water. It runs on hydrogen. It's basically got these giant high pressure tanks in it. You have to find hydrogen refilling stations, kind of like the same thing we were talking about at the start with uh, Schwarzenegger's H2 Hummer. Um, but it does run on hydrogen, basically no emissions. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's a good direction to go in. From what I've seen, the prices on hydrogen uh, aren't even quite comparable to gasoline yet. It's a little too expensive. So the actual part that Stan was supposedly working on of converting water into hydrogen at a fast enough rate to power an engine is a very important factor. So you can have your hydrogen powered car, but you can't quite have your car that actually runs on water yet. Uh, is it going to be cracked someday? I certainly hope so. Obviously there are people working on it in their garages, <laughs> blowing up their bubble things. Um, I'm sure that there are people looking at this from several different angles. Um, but when you've got these kind of hard, strict laws of science that you can't get around, like the amount of energy going in can't be greater than the amount of energy coming out, it does certainly make it tricky. Um, I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever really see this work in quite the way that Stanley was imagining it, but I do think it's pretty awesome that he was imagining like that. In terms of the mystery around his death, kind of hard to say. Uh, I think it's interesting, the story that his brother has told us. I think it's interesting first that we only have that account really from his brother, and that's the account that has been replicated. I can't really find any details outside of what I've told you guys about. It's literally just that same story or different pieces of that same story over and over. We don't have great information from law enforcement about what happened around this. Like I said, the full autopsy report isn't quite out. The coroner's report and the uh, toxicology are, and they are basically pointing towards what seems like a natural death here. So uh, it's tough, but it's tough for me to call it just kind of a, yeah, case solved. We don't need to worry about that one too. And that's why I wanted to talk about it with you guys here on Brain Scratch. Now let's talk about it in the comments below. Let me know your thoughts. Do you think that Stanley was murdered? Do you think that Stanley died of natural causes? Do you think that this car really worked at all? Do you think that this whole thing was a scam from the start? Maybe that's part of why he was kind of uh, distrusting, it seems like, from the, the uh, bits that we heard about his personality. Let's talk about it. 
Thanks for spending some time with me on today's Brain Scratch. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. See you back here on Monday on the Lord and Arts Channel.